I'm sure you wouldn't be here if you weren't aware that there is this primary proto-religion, Paleolithic in age, worldwide in extent, that seems to involve uh, the acquisition of extraordinary power to uh, heal or disrupt the community. The acquisition of this power obtained through the intercession of intermediate disincarnate beings that are variously called spirits, demons, harukas, angels, powers, principalities. And that this notion that somehow the mental universe of human beings is an animated cosmos, a hierarchy of energies, uh, is there when the dawn of self-reflection and reason uh, comes into being. This seems to be almost the proto-condition of human thought. And yet it is uh, very exotic to us as the inheritors of a very, uh, a 500 year long tradition of uh, positivism and rationalism that has completely uh, denumanized the universe, completely uh, taken away any mystery or any hint of animate intent that might have infused nature, and replaced it with insta instead with the notion of nature as object, nature as uh, property, nature as something which is to be cut apart and, uh, and dissected. How many of you happened to be at the John Ford Theater event a couple of weeks ago? Well, I want to recall something to you that happened during that evening, which was during the question and answer period, a man got up and said that he had thrown a hexagram for the destiny of the planet, and would I discuss the hexagram? And I did then, and I want to again, because I've thought about it. I thought it was a profound moment uh, in the history of public policy discussion that this hexagram of the destiny of the planet, which had been spontaneously thrown by someone in the audience, should then serve as the spring point for a discussion. Uh, the hexagram that had been thrown was work on what has been spoiled, changing into the cauldron. The changing line said, work on what has been spoiled by the father. <coughs> it seems to me that we could take this throw and its change as an image around which to build what we're trying to do this weekend. Work on what has been spoiled. What has been spoiled in the exterior world is the planet. Our stewardship has run amok. What has been spoiled on the interior plane is the interior image of the planet, which is the feminine. Working on what has been spoiled by the Father is an injunction to abandon the patriarchal model, the egocentric model, in favor of the kind of partnership society that Rian Eisler is arguing for based on the scholarship of Maria Gambutis. An archaic revival, a return to models in the past, in the distant past. Well then, so what about the change? The change is to the cauldron. The cauldron is one of only two hexagrams in the I Ching that refer to an artificial object. The other one is the well, which strictly speaking is not an art of, is, you know, in this intermediate range because it's a penetration of the earth. But the cauldron is clearly an image of uh, the synthetic. Not only is it a cast object, 
but it is the master implement of cooking, the primary transformation of the natural into the synthetic that informed the primitive world. It is also symbolic of the womb, the alchemical vessel, also the pressure cooker, the dissolver, the steamer. So I think that uh, there was something, as there always is with the I Ching, something fairly prophetic in this throw that shows us the redemption of the planet as an exterior task linked to the redemption of the feminine within each of us as a task of spiritual growth and redefinement leading to this shamanic cauldron, this vessel in which an alchemical transformation is to be wrought. Some of you who are scholars of this stuff may know Mercy Eliade's book, uh, The Forge and the Crucible, where he argues very forcibly that the, uh, the phonic image of the shaman is the smith, and that the smith, as the worker of metal, as the one who goes into the bowels of the maternal matrix and returns with rarefied metals that can then be paradoxically fashioned into objects of art or weaponry, is exemplary of the movement of the shaman figure into the more explicit realm of technos the creator shaman. Recall Hephaestus in the Iliad. He was the armament maker for Odysseus men, and he, he, he was able to beat armor of such wrought intensity that when you looked into it, you saw villages and rivers and islands and ships at sea and gods working the fates of men. In other words, this summoning of art and order out of the products of the unconscious is a kind of open-ended task. The shaman is the archetype of the artist, the archetype of the creator, the maker, homo faber, the maker of tools. And I would argue that uh, in the same way that Iliad in the Forge in the Crucible traces the evolution of proto-metallurgic shamanism into early smithing and hence into the more florid expressions that you get in alchemical literature. In the same way that that was done by Iliad, it's possible to argue that you can carry that process forward and see, in fact, that the aspirations of the 20th century in its most Faustian expression, the manipulation of matter, the taking control of the weather, uh, the splitting and releasing of the energy in the atom, that these are all, in fact, uh, completions of explicitly defined shamanic tasks. It's just that somehow the price of being able to work the miracle was literally loss of soul by virtue of having to opt in to the metaphor that nature it herself had no soul. In other words, it's like uh, modern man has made the journey into the realm of the Golam. In order to be in the realm of the Golam, you must shed your own soul and leave it behind you. Well, this is the cultural situation that we inherit. Um, Jean-Paul Sartre in uh, his major opus, I think it was Being and Nothingness, which was sort of summed up 20th century philosophy, said, nature is mute. That is the existential situation. Well, to me, this is like an apotheosis of wrong-headedness. Uh, nature is not mute. It must be that man is deaf to hold that position, you see, because nature reinforces uh, the natural set of conclusions which we tend to call feminine, that all things flow, 
that nothing is permanent, that form comes into being, is sustained and dissolves, that there is a kind of round of eternal return, that uh, worth is in the moment, that it is depth of felt experience that empowers a life well lived. Well, these are things which are all uh, argued for by this repressed point of view that has survived on, in modernism as only a thin thread of tradition reaching back beyond the collapse of the Greco-Roman world to a time when these ideas actually dominated and flourished. <laughs>